We're back. This is Dave Vellante, and this is The Cube. I'm here with Charlie Sennett. We're at MIT. Uh, we're talking about cyber politics, cyberspace, and the, the governance gap. Al Berkeley is here. He's the chairman of Princeton Capital Management. Al, welcome to The Cube. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So you were on a panel earlier. We were just talking about um, some of the perspectives that you guys uh, brought to the table, the dimensions of, of cybersecurity. But I want to start with Princeton Capital Management. How is it that you're here in this uh, forum at, at MIT? How did, you, how did that all come about? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons I'm here. One of them is I'm on the board of business executives for national security, which is one of the sponsors. And we have an interest in dealing with the cyber problem that fits pretty well with the interests of, of, the, uh, of the MIT and Harvard. So what is that interest? Well, specifically, uh, Business Executives for National Security is an unusual nonprofit in that it has individual members, no corporate members. We pay our own way. We don't, go, we don't ask for grants. We give policy advice specifically to the DOD and several other government agencies, uh, and we don't charge the government anything for it. So we're a bunch of business executives, typically CEOs, the, a, a, a responsible executive in the government will put a problem to us. We will assemble a group. We will work on that for six months to a year and go back and give our best advice that we possibly can. One of the issues that we were asked to deal with was the cyber problem. And as we dug into it, we found that the big companies have plenty of resources to deal with cyber. That the real problem is the next tier down. Companies that have valuable intellectual property or valuable a valuable role in a supply chain, but don't have the staff and the scale to really deal with cyber in a sophisticated way. So that's the group that we're trying to figure out how to create more awareness and to give some tools where the CEO can begin to attack the cyber problem without being intimidated by it. And cyber security is one of those areas where the little guy has, uh, has, has remained at a disadvantage. I mean, that's not been the case with a lot of other infrastructure challenges, like you think about cloud computing, how a little guy can, you know, st start a business in his in his in his home office, right? right? No problem, and, right. and build a, a, a something to scale. But security's been been quite a challenge, and the the philosophy has generally been, okay, let's build a moat, right? You know, and, and but sometimes the queen wants to leave her castle, and, right. and so it becomes a, this very complicated. Um, a challenge for, for folks, and most of the investment has been on digging that, that moat, and then the little guys are out of money by the time. Yes, <laughs> right well, the let me tell done. you, you happen to be on one of the most interesting aspects of this, because the paradigm is just about to change. You are so right, that it's been what we call network-centric security. Mm -hmm. It's just about to have added to it what's called data-centric security, and you've seen some, you know, I'm a financial guy, and I run a chairman of a money management company, and we look for investments that are in paradigm changing positions. One of the new technologies that's come out that's caused, for example, old Unisys, the old, you know, the old computer company that nobody thought much of as growth, that caused their stock to double, is a new technology that hardens the data. It does not necessarily harden the network. And what's happened is the market's begun to discover this. Well, you see posters around here at MIT about defense in depth, where you've got a you know, firewall and you've got passwords and you've got deep packet inspection and you've got encryption. All to keep people away from the data. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And what the new, the, wrong guys. the next, the next <laughs> layer of this is going to be really hardening the data by encrypting it, by dispersing it. And Unisys and, and IBM also came into the market with a product in July that I think is going to be game changing, and people haven't really figured it out yet. Well, and you look, you look at the Prism database that the NSA developed. I mean, it's developed on a on a platform called Accumulo that gives you you know cell level security at the data. So it's a right. you're you're talking about a whole new mindset of, right. of how to protect. I asked somebody earlier, is, is security a do over? And they said, yeah, actually it, it is, and this may be as part of that do over. Well, I think it is, and and uh, what will happen eventually, uh, data centric security will replace a lot of the network centric security elements. But in the beginning, people aren't going to be willing to give up the older stuff, so you're just going to add another layer until people see what the new approach can really save. So that adds c complexity and yes, <laughs> yes, and, and cost, and it's all that, it's that it's that trade-off that we were talking about in the session this morning between you know freedom, agility, and right. and, and, mm -hmm. and risk and protection. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask about um, about governance. There's been much discussion of a sense that the current governance. Uh, in the cyber world is just not sustainable. 
from a business perspective, do you agree with that take? And what do you think uh, of those who are saying that there's just not enough being done about this? It's not being thought through in a coordinated way. Well, uh, from the one of the things that, that I did in a prior life was to chair the President's Infrastructure Advisory Council. And one of our charters was cyber. In fact, our original charter was cyber only. And what you find in the government is the the issue is authorities, what the law permits, what the law requires. And there are some gaps in authority. And let me give you a specific example. There is a question, a gray area in the law, that if the government asks me to do something and I do it, does the government have any liability? If the government asks me to do something and I do it, do I have liability? Do I have to do more than the government asks if the government's ask me for something that's been superseded by new technology. And, the, and a more interesting issue is if I communicate with you about cyber vulnerabilities because the government wants me to communicate with you about cyber vulnerabilities and you're not the government, do we create any new liabilities? So part of the legislative agenda is to clarify these emerging gray issues. Now that being said, you're absolutely right that there are a lot of uh, hands in the soup here trying to figure out how to get this done right. In general, I think there are some really hard working smart people, not only in the U.S. government, but in other governments that I've interacted with on a personal basis who are trying to figure out how to do this and are trying to figure out how to do it in a way that balances personal, uh, personal liberties and group security. Just to sharpen the edge of this, I mean, we have the president of ICANN here saying that the current system of governance is not sustainable. Does, does Do business executives, those in Benz and others, do they feel the same way? Do they feel the sense of urgency? Well, I think they feel the sense of urgency, but I'm not sure that they think that the current situation is unsustainable. There's a sort of a uh, uh, an optimism on the part of the business executives that I deal with that these are solvable problems if men of goodwill will get together and, and deal with them. Now. This is a very complex set of issues when, when my goodwill is not your goodwill. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that, you know. <laughs> Well, and that's been one of the, that, so that puts a, a, a tension point or an intersection at least between business executives who had large corporations and the desire for the internet to be free mm -hmm. and this confluence of events and then people, small businesses like, like mine at Global Post and other people who are entrepreneurs are right caught in the whipsaw of this. But one question would be, like, where, where do we begin? How do we really get the ball rolling in a productive way to think through governance that will work for all? Well, I think one thing that uh, you need to do is start, uh, and we, do this, we think about this in tiers. By the way, we think about the whole problem as what's called a complex adaptive system, where you've got a whole ecology of predator and prey and, and solo operators and, and gangs and you know, good, gangs for good, gangs for bad. So it's it's whatever human. We turn it into a video game. And then yeah, we, then game mechanics. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but but I think the the right place to do is to is to do the things that you can control. Then you need to cooperate with someone else. The things that you together can control. For example, if I can if I can do my share to do the silly things like passwords and and mm -hmm. patches, mm -hmm. I'm probably taking care of eighty percent of the problem at my personal level. If I, as, as an executive, can get everybody in my company to do that, I've helped. So I move to the company level. That's interesting. Then yeah. you probably move to the to the industry level, and I'll give you an example. I'm from the financial services industry, and I was one of the financial services industry representatives on the National Infrastructure uh, Advisory Council. And the financial services industry shares information among its members before it takes a problem to the government. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is is that well-intentioned but conflicted incentives cause different government agencies to do different things mm -hmm. if you go to the government. Some of them are law enforcement operations where they want to gather evidence and they will let a harm persist while they gather evidence. Others are more preventive in nature, like the Secret Service. They'll get in there and, and stop the problem and then uh, the, industry, uh, the industry doesn't know exactly what response the government's going to take so it's gotten, it's developed a method among the largest companies of sharing this information among themselves before going to the government. Well, that's a very difficult wrinkle for, uh, for uh, government employees to stomach.
What do you mean you go into each other before you come into us? We're here to help. Well, the more sophisticated ones understand it, and it has to do with this liability issue, and it has to do with the, it has to do with trust, it has to do with predictability, and uh, it, it's we're, we're sort of working it out. I think the right way to do this is industry by industry. There are 18 defined industries that the NIAC is responsible for. There's also the telecommunications industry, which something called the NSTAC is responsible for. And they're all struggling with how to get it right for their industry. Why is it important for an industry by industry approach? Because the electric utility industry, which is a national grid, or the railroad industry, which is a national grid, is very different than commercial facilities operators, of which there are two million, three million property owners, mm -hmm. each of whom run their own five So I can see that model. It makes sense for things like you know the industry collaborating around best practices of, of fraud or risk or, or even even marketing to you know rise all, all boats. Um, but tie that in, Al, if you could, to to cyber. Um, in terms of your, your industry specifically, mm -hmm. are you now proactively getting together? I mean, the financial services has always been a leading edge of, of security. But well, financial services has an advantage because we think about, and have, we have a long history of banding together in the face of bank robbers. You know, whether they were on a, right. with a six gun or were in the, in the Al Capone era or whatever it was. So we're very uh, used to cooperating on the uh, issues where money's flowing out of the system. Nobody holds back from helping the other guy. It's a little more difficult, actually, in other industries where, uh, for, for example, in many companies in the tech industry see themselves competing with the other people in the tech industry. Well, the banks compete too, but they'll give up that competition for this particular issue. So I, I think that you're going to find that uh, cooperation is going to increase as people become intolerant of the damage that's being done. And the target uh, credit card issue is a good example. It's just raising people's sense of, all right, we got to hike up our britches and deal with this problem. Let's figure it out. It happened in the government, I'm told, when a foreign power's software was found on the Secretary of Defense's desk in the Pentagon. The government basically said, okay, enough is enough. We're going to figure this out. And you see this move from network-centric to data-centric in government policy. There were public announcements by defense and intelligence agencies about moving to data-centric approaches where you keep the data encrypted and you keep it dispersed. Well, and I think your your proposal, uh, the industry by industry model was the right one because the, the data is so different by, by industry and, and even the data models. Some is right. distributed, some is centralized, some mm -hmm. is a hybrid. Um, so I, I have to ask you, I've been talking about Bitcoin all, all day today, but uh, as a financial services executive, um, what do you make of things like crypto currencies um, and, and what's happening with Bitcoin and other alternative currencies that are getting funded by, by venture capitalists. Uh, uh, is this something that your industry is, I mean, I know it's looking at hard, but have you started to sort of squint through the, the maze? And Well, there are actually all kinds of currencies and many electronic currencies, including frequent flyer miles. It's just another kind of currency. I think the issue is more sophisticated. I think that nation states spend an awful lot of money protecting their currency, the, the validity of their currency. And I don't see any private com company coming up with the resources that the U.S. Treasury has, that the Secret Service has, to deal with what will emerge as the criminal side of a new currency. So to me, as an investor, I have no interest in investing in what I view as a speculation. It's, it's like any other faith-based, I'm using not, not religious faith, but faith-based product where I'm depending on your uh, credibility to make it whole, I don't have confidence in that. I'd be much farther over towards a sovereign power backing it up. Yeah, so you need a means of exchange, but you also need a stable you know, <laughs> repository to store it in. Right? Yeah, you do, yeah. absolutely. Okay, good. All right, Al, well listen, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE and uh, appreciate your support of this event and uh, and thank you for your good, your good efforts here. <laughs> thank you. All right, pleasure meeting yeah. you. All right, keep Thanks. it right there, everybody. Thanks. We'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE. We're live from MIT in Cambridge.